Now there are two different approaches to how to reform, uh, how to go about reforming these ancient, decayed, corrupted, superstitious, and perhaps even idolatrous churches. And uh, both of them were tried, largely unsuccessfully. One of them was to start with the top. You go and you talk to the patriarch, you talk to the priests, and then it will kind of trickle down. So this is trickle-down missiology. That's not from Blinko. I just made that up. So it's trickle-down missiology. You start with the top guys and it'll trickle down to the pews. Uh, if I had an audience here, I would say, guess why that didn't work, but I don't, so I'm just going to tell you. It didn't work for multiple reasons, and one of the key ones was that this was an extremely uh, hierarchical and monarchical tradition with a strong concept of the episcopate. Um, and so when you started to go to the priests, and especially to the bishops, and especially to the patriarch, and you say, you know what, actually, in the end, every believer is his own priest. And uh, you don't need to, you know, and every, and every believer can, sit, can and should sit down with the Bible and read it on his own. Just being able to have confidence that God's Holy Spirit will guide that person rightly. And all these, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying that these ideas are incorrect or wrong or anything like that, but I am saying that you've got to understand why this would not be a popular message at all when you're going to a patriarch or to a bishop or indeed even even to some to some priests. Uh, this is not something that would make you any friends. So that was one way that people try to reform these decrepit, ancient, decayed, idolatrous, superstitious churches. The other one was to start from the bottom up. You start with the people. You start with the laity. You don't take them out of their Sunday morning mass or the divine liturgy if they're in the orthodox tradition. You don't take them out of that. But what you do is you, you add to it. You say, you can keep going to that if you really want to. Um, but you really need to come to the Bible study and study the Bible with us at the missionary's home on, you know, Wednesday night or whatever. Well, this works for some time, but eventually this also becomes untenable because the leadership feels threatened by it. And eventually, the bishops of the church, and this is all under the Ottoman Empire, well, not all of it, mostly under the Ottoman Empire, the bishops of the church, the various churches, eventually end up saying, look, if you have anything to do with missionaries, we're going to kick you out. You cannot come to this church anymore. And uh, that ends up being devastating, because the, in the Ottoman Empire, the way that a non-Muslim had legal status, Okay, not legal rights, but just an existence as a legal person was by belonging to what was called a dhimme, which is the Arabic word, or a millet, which is the Turkish word. And they're, they're, the millet system is the Turkish Ottoman way of adapting the Islamic dhimme system. And uh, so once, you know, once the... Uh, once, once the Armenian bishop said, okay, Joe over there, he's no longer part of the Armenian church. He was just a non-person. You could kill him, you could take his stuff, and he had no legal status. He had no, he was not, he couldn't sue you any more than a tree could. Okay, he had no legal standing. So, eventually, a Protestant millet is set up. But uh, you should be able to understand why it's such a difficult uh, period for many of these Christians who are in the traditional, the older ancient churches, but they're attracted to this dynamic, more free-thinking, more uh, exploratory, more obviously much more modern approach to the Christian faith, and uh, yet they know that they can't leave their churches, so it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard situation. Indeed, this is the situation that will lead eventually to the formation of Arab congregations around uh, in the area of the Transjordan. Uh, eventually, some of the uh, bishops over there, the Orthodox bishop, says, you cannot read the Bible, you cannot have a Bible, 
uh, and also come to the Greek Orthodox Church. So the, the Anglican bishop says, well, you know, we're, you've pushed us too far. I can't do anything. I have the obligation to establish a congregation for these people. Uh, I would have liked to have worked with you, but I, now I see I can't. Well, you can cut that pizza in different ways and assign more or less blame to different parties. I'm not interested in, in uh, you know, getting into that discussion, but it was a real, a real big issue, a really difficult and challenging concept and challenging decision for everybody to make. So, how is this relevant to the, uh, to the question of the Nestorians? Uh, or the Assyrians. Here's what the Anglicans do that's different. See, the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, eventually, they come to the point where they're like, look, we need to just establish a Protestant church. And, and they do that. The Anglicans, who are Anglo-Catholic, these are Tractarian folks, and they're over in uh, Kurdistan, what is now Kurdistan, in these mountainous villages where there's all these Assyrians or Nestorians, and they never go the way of proselytism, at least during the period we're looking, we're looking at up to World War I. They never go the way of proselytism. Um, they always work with the Assyrian church. And that is so interesting, isn't it? Because it goes back to that theme of in my end is my beginning, in my beginning is my end. Here are these Anglican missionaries and they're saying, you know, in the end, we are going to honor you, even though we have all these reservations about we have all these reservations about your theology. You know, we don't know why you guys don't like the Council of Ephesus. We don't feel good about that. But in this case, the balance came down when it when it came to the time of what does it mean to be an Anglican? Does it mean to be Catholic? or does it mean to be Reformed and Protestant, in Iran, or in Kurdistan with the Assyrians, during the time period that we're looking at, they come down on the side of identifying with the ancient churches. And they say, yeah, we may be, we may be British, we may have uh, broken ties with the Sea of Rome during the, during the Reformation in the, in the 16th century, um, but you know what? We, we understand you and we absolutely respect the integrity of your church. So when the Assyrians decide to become Russian Orthodox because the Assyrians are being massacred on every side by the Kurds who are all Muslims and a couple of them are Yazidi. Uh, and the Nestorians, they want a protector. They want a big brother with a big stick. The Americans are like, oh, we're not political, which is a totally stupid thing to say in the Middle East because everything is political. And then the Anglicans are like, well, yeah, you know, we don't quite know what we can do to help you guys. But then the Russians come in and they're like, oh yeah, we, you, we've got your back. So the Assyrians, the Nestorians, and mass, many of them become Russian Orthodox. And they all, all of a sudden realize that the Council of Ephesus was indeed correct. And they, you know, so they all become Orthodox. And then, and here's the striking thing, when the Assyrian patriarch says, we would like for you to turn over all of your Anglican schools to, to us, or to our helpers, our new helpers, our new friends, the Russian Orthodox, the Anglicans did it. Now, was that a good move or not? Well, this is history. It's what happened. And um, <clears throat> now, I do want to mention that some of the main actors in this uh, and these events that are going on over in Kurdistan and Persia, these are not necessarily people from the CMS, which is much more evangelical, but these are people uh, who are sent on kind of like an embassy by the Archbishop of Canterbury. So they have uh, really a, a special and different way of relating to the church. In any case, the Anglican mission in Kurdistan and Persia seems to be fairly erratic. It starts and it stops and uh, it's, it's not especially uh, constant, although later on an Anglican church will take ground there, but that is uh, after, after the First World War. And then that Anglican church will indeed incorporate numerous 
converts from Shia Islam, including including uh, a bishop who's a convert from from Islam. But that's that's a different part of history. Well, that's Persia. Finally, okay, so George Percy Badger, um, who I said, he's one of these guys who goes on this mission to interact with uh, the Assyrians. And one of the things that he does when he's given that task is he goes to the Patriarch, Patriarch Shimon, and he says, Patriarch, I want to warn you against the Presbyterians, <laughs> these American Presbyterians. They may say they're great Christians and so on, but guess what? They don't have bishops. You know, guess, because again, he's Anglo-Catholic. He's, he's a Tractarian sort of guy. <clears throat> um, and George Percy Badger eventually in 1852 uh, will publish a book called The Nestorians and Their Rituals. The Nestorians and Their Rituals. Um, in 1821, okay, 1821, so this is 22 years after the foundation of the CMS, we have the foundation of a really curious, bizarre, strange thing in New York called the DFMS. Now, probably most of you know some about the DFMS. It's the Domestic and Foreign Mission Society. And unlike the CMS or the LJS um, or the granddaddy of American mission boards, which is the ABCFM, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission, which is largely Presbyterian and Congregationalist. Um, the DFMS is not... Technically, if you're an Episcopalian, you're a member of the DFMS. That's really what it comes down to. It's really a strange thing. Now, most... I'd probably got to say 99% of the members of the DFMS don't even know that they belong to a mission society. Now, it's a little bit rich to call the DFMS a mission society, especially an FMS, a foreign missionary society, because the DFMS does not send out, as I mentioned earlier, does not send out uh, permanent uh, long-term long -term missionaries anymore, and certainly not to this sort of place, um, you know, to certainly not to evangelize non-Christians. I mean, that's... That would be incredibly non-politically correct. And furthermore, my understanding is that they don't work anywhere where there's not an Anglican province, which seems rather self-defeating because most of the unevangelized parts of the world, uh, you know, by definition, don't really have established churches. So, yeah. You know, but the DFMS has a different vision of, of mission, I suppose, than, uh, than certainly than the CMS back in the 1900s. They really did want, they wanted to convert the heathen, and that's how they would say it. So the DFMS today does uh, grant funds and to, you know, hospitals and clinics and, and, and so on. So I guess they do, uh, they do help Christians abroad. It, if you want to consider that foreign missions, then I guess that does uh, qualify. But anyway, this is the Episcopal Church's way of kind of getting on the bandwagon, and that's in 1821. Um, then I got some, some, some dates for you here, and now I want to shift from, eight, from uh, Persia and, you know, Armenia, Kurdistan, that whole area. I want to shift back over to the Holy Land, to Transjordan. Of course, uh, back then it's not called Transjordan, but uh, what is today Israel and Jordan? And uh, indeed, Egypt. Well, in uh, 1833, the LJS, the London Jew Society, establishes their first base in Jerusalem. And John Nicolaisen, who is a Dane and a Lutheran who became Anglican, is one of their missionaries. And uh, John Nicolaisen and his family, these are the, to, to our knowledge, these are the first, this is the first Protestant family to live in Jerusalem, ever. The first Protestant family to live in Jerusalem. Okay, obviously not the first one to visit Jerusalem or to sojourn in Jerusalem, but to really settle there and say, yes, we, this is where we live. And John Nicolaisen, or Hans Nicolaisen, will become a very uh, important um, figure in the establishment of Christ Church, which is oftentimes called the oldest church, the oldest Protestant church, or the first Protestant church in, in the Holy Land. We'll get to the fineries of whether it is or not soon. 
Um, and John Nicolaisen establishes his, uh, his base of operations there in Jerusalem. Now, now we can move back to the States. Um, because, and we'll get back to the Holy Land in a minute. But we get back to the States and we find a guy named Horatio Southgate. A very obscure figure, but during one of the general conventions of the Episcopal Church, three missionary bishops were established. One was for the Indian Territory out in the, the Wild West, one was for China, and one was for Turkey. Well, let me see if I can get this. He's the missionary bishop for the domains and dependencies of the Sultan of Turkey. I believe that was his entire name, or his title. But first, before he becomes the missionary bishop, um, Horatio Southgate is born in 1812, and he is uh, born in Portland, Maine, into a Congregationalist family. While he's studying seminary, something happens, and he realizes the errors of Congregationalism and decides to become an Episcopalian, and he does. And then as an Episcopalian deacon, so not yet a priest, but a deacon, he leaves on his research tour in 1836. So he's been commissioned, he's been appointed by the DFMS, that domestic and foreign missionary society, to go and to do some researches all around basically the Ottoman Empire and figure out what is the most strategic and advantageous place to establish a missionary base. And you can read the sermon that he, that he gave shortly before he left. And this sermon is quite interesting. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this sermon, but I want to make a few points. The first one is this. This is very important. The first point is that Southgate, he states explicitly in this sermon, uh, he says, everybody knows that the main theory right now about how to reach the Muslims with the gospel is to reform the ancient churches and then those ancient churches will evangelize the Muslims. And he refutes that argument. He says this is why that argument is incorrect. He says this is why, and, and, and I'm not going to go into the reasons, you can read them online, anglicanhistory.org, or just Google Horatio Southgate. The name of the sermon, which you can read online, is uh, an encouragement to missionary efforts among the Mohammedans, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he basically takes apart that argument. For example, one of the things he says is, look, no one's ever tried it. Why are we going to go over there and invest all of our time in these ancient churches when no one's really tried to engage with the Muslims? And then in this sermon he goes on to say, look, I think that the most open, the most strategic base for Muslim evangelism is going to be in, or going to be with, the Persian Shia Muslims. And he analyzes them. He said, look, the, the Persians, they have their own language, they have their own culture, they're Shia, many of them are very secular, a lot of them are not very devout. We think, I think that this is really the place to engage in missions. Well, Southgate goes, and he writes his his missionary research book, like what I've been talking about, this is the age of, of research, although we're starting to get into the age of church planting. And, uh, you know, he writes his book called uh, hmm, Narrative of a Tour. Let's see if I've got this here. Narrative of a Tour Through Armenia, Kurdistan, Persia, and Mesopotamia. That book is published in 1840. Southgate uh, published several other things as well, but that's his main uh, book in terms of sharing the, the fruit of his own research. Um, he gets back and he says, okay, forget this. We're not going to be able to go to Persia. But he says, I do want to go to Constantinople. So he is basically admitting that he no longer had this vision for direct evangelism 
of Muslims. That, I've, from my point of view, very unfortunate because, um, well, I think Horatio Southgate could have been a great influential figure, but as it is, he's a very obscure figure with a short missionary, well, relatively short, I mean, less than 20 years, though he managed to get back to the States and not die there. So he goes off to Constantinople, and he is the, a missionary to the Greeks, okay? So after he was a deacon, he, during that entire tour he was a deacon, he comes back to the States, he's priesthood and eventually raised to the station of a bishop, consecrated as the bishop of the, the missionary bishop of the dependencies and uh, domains of the Sultan of Turkey. And uh, he goes back to Constantinople, where he's a missionary to the Greeks. So he's not a missionary to the Turks, to the Armenians. He's a missionary to the Greeks. And remember, back then, this is before all the Greeks had been purged uh, from Constantinople, so there was a considerable Greek population there. Uh, there isn't any more. I mean, the Greeks are almost totally gone from Turkey, as are the Armenians and the Nestorians. I mean, all that's left in Turkey today are a bunch of Turks and some Kurds. So, you know, Turkey has really purged the non-Muslim population from, from its midst. They've been very successful with that project. But anyway, back then in this period of time, the 1840s, there were still a good number of Greeks over there. And again, he goes there specifically with the intention not of not of uh, proselytizing Turks, or sorry, proselytizing the Greeks, the Greek Orthodox, but of helping to reform, helping them to reform their church. And he actually gets into a big kerfuffle, again, on this topic. And again, we find the interesting Mr. George uh, Badger present. The, the full details of the, uh, of the incident are at best obscure, but it appears that uh, Southgate was trying to tell one of the Armenian Christians, look, you need to be aware of these American Christians, uh, these American, these Presbyterians, um, because they, uh, you know, they, they basically want to take you away from your own church. That's what it appears to be. And so there's a, a war of, of letters, and Southgate publishes uh, a pamphlet called The Vindication of the Reverend Horatio Southgate, and then the American board missionaries who are in Constantinople publish their reasons why they're upset, and then, you know, Southgate publishes his letter, and this is all going on in the States. Um, and meanwhile, the ABCFM, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission, they're talking with the missions board of the, uh, of the Episcopal Church to figure out, hey, what's, what's going on here? Eventually, Southgate returns. He asks General Convention for more funds, for more people. Uh, they're either unwilling or unable to provide for those, and his missionary work over there is, is terminated, and he goes on to a uh, you know, long, long career as a, as a priest in the Episcopal Church, in, uh, mostly in New England, I think. So, um, that's another example of you have people going abroad to run into this question of who are we? What, what, what does it mean for us to be us? And if that debate would have happened in the United States in the context of a diocese or a parish, it may have been a very heated debate or argument. I mean, are we more Catholic or are we more Protestant? Are we going to be more sympathetic to the Eastern Christians or are we going to identify with our historical origin as a Western church? What are we? And if that had happened in a parish or a diocese, it probably, you know, would have taken its toll. Um, but the thing is, since it happened in the mission field, it ended up uh, being the occasion of, of this, all this publication and writing and everything. So it just, again, was written, written large. And you can see how American Christians, and British Christians as well, 
were able to, with uh, an amazing degree of skill, export their local squabbles to the mission field. The, the final aspect uh, that I want to mention here, or the final mission field that I want to talk about, after having spoken about Persia, and then, or Kurdistan, Kurdistan, much of Kurdistan being a part of Persia, and then after having made those comments on the American mission, a uh, mission of Southgate to Constantinople, I uh, want to talk a little bit more about the foundation of the church in the Holy Land. Now, I've already made a couple of notes because uh, I'm trying to go chronologically here. So we already have the foundation of the LJS. And then in 1833, we have John Nicolaisen, the, the Danish Lutheran who became Anglican, and he's living there in Jerusalem, the first permanent ones over there. In, during this period, the 1830s and the 1840s, there is, um, well, a lot of stuff is happening, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. But uh, one of the curious things that happens is that the king of Prussia, approaches the Church of England and says, you know, let's go ahead and establish a joint, not an Anglican uh, Episcopal, not a Lutheran Episcopate in Jerusalem. Let's establish just a Protestant Episcopate in Jerusalem. And that Protestant bishop would be the bishop for all the Protestants, whether they're Anglican or you know, English, basically, whether they're Lutheran, Prussian or German or Danish or what have you, or even, you know, something else. This would be the bishop for all of the Protestants. And he says, and I'm willing to, you know, fund it fairly generously with a yearly grant of, I don't remember the amount. And eventually, uh, one of the Archbishops of Canterbury or the church leaders in England, they say, yeah, we'll do it. And the rule is that they're going to go back and forth in terms of who is who gets to choose who's going to be the bishop in Jerusalem, and the first choice goes to the English. Now, this is very um, it's a very hot topic for the Anglo Catholics. They don't like this at all. And uh, John Henry Newman, or should I say, blessed John Henry Newman, recently, um, you know, he specifically mentioned that as one of the things that he was upset about, and one of the reasons why he. Um, why, why he left, why he left the Church of England and became Roman Catholic. He said, you know, there's already a bishop over there. Everyone knows that the Orthodox bishop is the bishop. So remember, from the Tractarian or Anglo-Catholic eyes, they would say, look, this is one of the three branches of the church. You know, why, why are you going to go send another bishop to be where a place in a city where a bishop already lives? You know, there's one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. The Orthodox Church is one of the three branches. We're one of the other three, and the Roman Catholic is one of the other three, and the rest of them are just a bunch of, uh, you know, sectarians with, uh, you know, without the sacraments and probably without means of grace for salvation. So from their point of view, they've got a, a strong argument. Well, the evangelicals carry the day on this one, and also there are real political benefits to having a bishop in Jerusalem. The French have their representation there, the Russians do, um, or eventually will. Jerusalem becomes a more and more important city. Now, during most of the Ottoman Empire, it was just a washed-up cesspool, and it was just a disgusting and disease-ridden, unsanitary, dangerous city. But during this time, uh, it's, it's increasing in, in its importance. So, they send a curious man named Michael Solomon Alexander to go and to be the first bishop in Jerusalem, Protestant bishop. Now, Solomon Alexander was born in, uh, on the continent, I think it was Germany or Prussia perhaps back then, and he, is, uh, he was a rabbi, so he's rabbi bishop, <coughs> or is that bishop rabbi uh, Michael Solomon Alexander is, and he's one of these Hebrew Christians. That's what he is, and uh, you know, so he's like Joseph Wolf. He's come to the conclusion that 
Jesus of Nazareth is indeed God's Messiah. And again, he never would have identified himself as no longer being Jewish, but of being Jewish, but also Christian, so Hebrew Christian. And he has a vision, this millenarian vision, like so many other people of the time do, and indeed in our day do, that there will be a large number of Jews coming to Christ uh, before the, the, the return of Christ, before the second advent of Christ. And he, he goes, he with his wife and his many children go over to Jerusalem to, uh, to um, be part of this missionary effort. And now remember, Nicolaisen is already there. And I mean, Solomon, or Michael Solomon Alexander, he gets, he gets a lot of the credit. He's the one who, with the name. He was the bishop. But really, Nicolaisen is, in many ways, the one who built that church. Now, uh, the British are also, during this period, establishing a consulate. They're establishing a consulate in Jerusalem. The Ottomans are deeply indebted to the British because the British have, through their military prowess, preserved the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. When Muslims say that, uh, you know, the, the imperial period was all about breaking up Muslim hegemony, uh, I say that's absolute rubbish. Maybe later on it became about that, but they didn't want to do that at first. At first, the British, or the and the British and the French as well, they wanted to preserve the integrity of the Ottoman Empire and went to great lengths to do that. Uh, it was only after they went in on the wrong side in the, the First World War that they felt that they had no other option but to chop up the whole region, which is what we have now. Uh, so the British had basically saved the Ottoman Empire, uh, or at least Egypt for the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottomans were indebted, and they said, okay, you can build a consulate here in Jerusalem. And then you get to a very thorny topic, a very difficult thing to talk about, which is building churches in Dar al-Islam. You see, in the Islamic Sharia, it is illegal to build or repair churches in Dar al-Islam without the express uh, permission of the caliph and at this time there's still a caliph remember there's a caliph up until 1924 so you got to have the permission of the top guy now the top guy is even if he knows politically that he needs to do it he's not going to do it even if he has the power to because he knows that the religious scholars in Istanbul will basically have his head on a plate so he doesn't do it so Christ Church is eventually established after very much travail inside the old city, inside the Jaffa Gate. And here's why I said earlier that I'm, it's not so clear whether it's a church or not, properly speaking. Because it was, they, what they got was permission to establish a personal chapel in the residence of the British consul. Now, I, does, it doesn't take a genius to realize that there is a legal, defini or legal difference then as, as there is now between having a personal chapel, even a rather large one, and between building a church. If you want to add on a room to your house and maybe have some stained glass and a little altar or table and call it your personal chapel, chapel that would probably be relatively easy to do if you had the funds for it. But if you wanted to uh, buy, buy that or have that same property and uh, raise, raise the house to the ground and construct a proper church, uh, it could be very difficult for you to, because of zoning. Well, those complexities are nothing compared to the complexities of the, the, the Sharia. So anyway, that's the only way that the Ottoman Empire or that the Ottoman port is able to satisfy both the British, to whom he owes his throne, and his Islamic scholars, without whom he cannot rule, is by saying, okay, well, it's a church, but it's not a church. And to the British, he says, look, you have a nice church. And to the <laughs> Islamic scholars, he says, oh, it is not a church. This is a, this is a political residence, and I've just given him permission to have his own uh, private place for his devotions. Um, 
that's an oversimplification of a very long story, but it gets you an idea of how complex the construction of Christ Church inside the Jaffa Gate is. There's a good book that talks more about it. There are two of them, actually, by Kelvin Crombie. Crombie is C-R-O-M-B-I-E, and that's For the Love of Zion, and then uh, one that's more about Bishop Alexander, and that's uh, A Jewish Bishop in Jerusalem. So both of those uh, books will shed some more light on the, the history of, of Christ Church. Well, Alexander arrives there, I think it takes something like seven years before they can actually, from, from the cornerstone to the opening of Christ Church in, uh, in Jerusalem. And Christ Church, for those of you who have been there, you know that it looks m more like a synagogue than like a church. Well, Alexander doesn't last long. Uh, Alexander was consecrated as the bishop the Protestant bishop in Jerusalem, okay, not bishop of Jerusalem, but the bishop in Jerusalem, and he was consecrated in December of 1841. He dies in 1845. He dies in Egypt, and then he's taken back to Mount Zion where he's, he's buried today. Uh, 1846 is when Samuel Gobat becomes the second Protestant bishop in Jerusalem, and he is a uh, French-Swiss, so, you know, now it's, it's not the, Brit the English folk's turn, it's the turn of the, uh, of the Lutherans. And again, you can understand why this is such a bold project, because imagine for the Anglo-Catholics, they look at the Lutherans and they say, well, you may call yourself Father Jim and such and such, but you guys don't even have bishops, so technically you are nothing other than a layman. Uh, but when the Lutherans go to the Anglicans and they say, this is Father Sam, and now we just, you know, you, you guys get your bishops together and consecrate him to be a bishop. And the Anglo-Catholics say, uh-uh, wait a second, he's got to be ordained a deacon and, a, and an elder before he can be consecrated to be a bishop. What are you talking about? You can see how complex all this is. And then there's the evangelicals who are just like, uh, we just want to evangelize the Jews, you know, because we know the end is coming. Again, overly simplistic, but it gives you an idea of some of the complexities at play here. Well, Samuel Gobat uh, does become the bishop, and he's basically the, the man who built the diocese. Uh, if, if Nicolaisen is, is the founding father of Christ Church, then Gobat is the founding father of the diocese. Alexander, he was there for too short of a time to really leave a lasting impression. Um, but uh, Samuel Gobat, who will serve from bishop, who will serve as bishop from 1846, so he's 47 years old when he arrives, until 1879. That is when he's 80 years old. Very long-serving bishop. And he dies in Jerusalem, and I believe he's also buried on, on Mount Zion. He's the one who built that diocese. He opened schools and clinics. And he also, it seemed, cooled to the zeal for evangelizing Jews. And during this time, he's partnering with the CMS a lot. And the CMS are going and doing the same things like the American Presbyterians were doing. They're going out and doing Bible studies and... Um, you know, places like Nazareth and, and Salt, which was then the, the main city and what, it's, what, to, what today is the country of Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan. And, you know, like I said, people got kicked out of the churches and he said, look, you're forcing my hand here, you Orthodox people. And again, he didn't have a high view of the Orthodox like the Anglo-Catholics did. He had a fairly low view of him, I would say, based on what I've read. And uh, so he says, okay, um, fair enough, we're going to start churches. And that really is when the first proper church, okay, not a chapel that's part of a political resonance, like Christ Church, but an actual independent congregation is established. And that is Christ Church in, in Nazareth, which is the church where me and my family uh, worship oftentimes when we're in Nazareth. And that is, uh, in 1871, the church is opened. Christ Church in Nazareth, for those of you who have been there, doesn't have a steeple. It has a, a tower, and it has just a square top, but no steeple because they ran out of funds. 
So that's why it has that kind of curious, strange appearance. So those are two of the earliest churches that we find. And by this time, you are finally at a period where uh, you know, you have fewer and fewer uh, Jewish converts, fewer and fewer people who are uh, identifying themselves as missionary to the Jews. And also, really, you just have a lot more Arabs and Palestinians coming in to the church. Uh, Gobat was evangelical. The CMS missionaries were evangelical. And so ultimately, unlike the Anglo-Catholic missionaries in Persia who just, you know, when, when the Assyrian patriarch said, can you just leave us the schools? Um, unlike those guys, you know, they were willing to try to work with the Orthodox authorities, but when it didn't work, it didn't work, and they, they were able to establish their own churches. Uh, the CMS... The, the CMS left a very uh, profound and deep low church influence uh, in, in what is today the Diocese of Jerusalem. And I've, I've written about that in, in some of my articles in Anglican and Episcopal History. In 1886, uh, there's, a, there's a third bishop after Gobat, but he only serves for two years and he dies. In 1886, the uh, agreement between the British, or rather between the English and the Prussians is formally dissolved. And in 1887, uh, a man who is suspected of having Anglo-Catholic or Tractarian leanings named uh, George Francis Popham Blythe is consecrated as Anglican Bishop in Jerusalem. And here we can really speak of an Anglican Bishop. He's not the Protestant Bishop, he's the Anglican Bishop in Jerusalem, right? Not of Jerusalem. And that's 87. He gets there and he finds that the LJS people who basically have built and have run Christ Church, uh, that they, uh, they're happy doing their own thing. Again, I don't know whose responsibility that was. I don't know if Blythe was standoffish towards them or vice versa or some mixture of the two. But he eventually came to the conclusion that he had to have his own cathedral church because Christ Church was not owned by the diocese as it is today. It is not owned by the diocese. It was owned by the, if I'm not mistaken, the LJS, the London Jew Society, owned Christ Church. So imagine being a bishop in Jerusalem and not, not having your own church building or office or anything like that. Eventually he will... Um, he will raise funds and, and have uh, the Cathedral Church of St. George the Martyr, which is to this day the Cathedral Church of the Diocese. He'll have that built, so that's under Blythe. And I've also written about that in Anglican and Episcopal history. And St. George's is built in 1898. Just a couple of other, of other short notes. Um, there are some other bright figures like Temple Gairdner, uh, who will go to Cairo. He's a brilliant linguist, uh, ethnomusicologist. He travels up and down the Nile collecting old tunes and devises a way to record them musically. Um, brilliant uh, translator. Um, but I don't want to talk too much about that. And then finally in 1910 we get to uh, the Edinburgh World Missions Conference. And that is oftentimes considered to today to be the beginning of the world missionary movement. Uh, and once after 19... The one thing to remember about the Edinburgh Conference in terms of mission to Muslims, and there were Anglicans represented there. Some of the main people who put it together were Anglicans, though it was not only Anglican. A couple of the things to remember is that first of all, the Anglo-Catholics insisted that Edinburgh uh, not include missionaries to South America. Now, why would they do that? This was a World Missions Conference, and it was a conference that was devoted to talking about the, uh, the evangelization of the unevangelized. So again, unlike the DFMS today, which doesn't really do that, DFMS does not send anyone anywhere, to my knowledge, to evangelize non-Christians. That's exactly what these people are doing. That's why they have Edinburgh 1910, so that they can evangelize non-Christians. And the Anglo-Catholics carry the day. They say, look, 
if you include South America, just because all these people are Roman Catholic, then we're not going to show up because those people are every bit as Christian as you or I. And finally, they, they, you know, the coordinators say, fine, no South America. So in that way, the Anglo-Catholics are quite successful in terms of setting up what will be discussed over at, um, over at this meeting, over at this conference in, in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1910. Uh, another one of the things that happens is that you have... Uh, you have missionaries, you know, missionaries to the Buddhists, to the Hindus, to the animists, and to the traditional religious people in Africa. And they're getting together and they're trying to figure out how they can come up with a theology of history. How can they look at all these new cultures and languages and customs that they've, that they've been living with, and to some degree really come to appreciate and cherish in some cases, how can they look at that and reconcile that with a good God who controls history and who has revealed his grace and salvation only in the one person of Jesus Christ? This is a good question. Christians have been talking about it forever, and it's good to talk about it, and I hope we will keep talking about it. Um, you get a lot of facile answers to it, saying, well, you know, everyone's saved. Okay. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. I'm not a universalist, but... I know a lot of Episcopalians are. Um, and then you get the other maybe extreme, which is, well, you know, God knows who's elect. If you're elect, you're elect. If you're not elect, there's really nothing you can do about it. So there. You know, you get all kinds of different answers, and I think most of the intelligent conversation happens somewhere in the in-between area there. Um, but anyway, it, it's a real question. It's a perennial question of the Christian faith, and these people having a profound devotion to Christ, but also uh, being aware not only of the good that they found in Hindu and Buddhist and Muslim cultures, but also being aware of many of the evil things that they found in these cultures. They really have to deal with this question. And by and large, the answer comes out that non-Christian religions should be examined and scrutinized, not uncritically, but they should be understood and be seen and be interpreted as um, a preparation for the gospel. A preparation for the gospel. So when we look at Hinduism, we should say, what is God doing in Hinduism that comes to fruition in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Okay? Now, in every culture, in every religion, there's going to be positive elements and negative elements. What are the positive elements that God, in His all-knowing grace and sovereignty has placed in Hinduism that we can use and that we can unfold and develop into the gospel of Christ. Again, not, not a new idea at all. You can find it all the way back in uh, Justin Martyr, one of uh, guy, a, lo a local boy from, uh, from the city of Nablus, or as it was called back then, Neapolis. Um, now, you can understand why that might work for Hindus and uh, Buddhists and animists and so on, but uh, take a second and ask yourself, why would that answer not be, why would that answer not work well for missionaries who are active in the Muslim world? And one of those is Temple Gairdner. Temple Gairdner is uh, the, the brilliant linguist, scholar, uh, archiver of write of, of writings missionary that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago he, he's not content with that answer neither is Samuel Zwemer who's from the Reformed Church of America and who is incredibly active in terms of of uh, stirring up Americans to engage in mission to Muslims why would they not like that well the answer the reason that they find this to be a, a dissatisfying answer is quite simple and it's just that Islam came after Christianity. You, you can't say that you know the, this is the appetizer and it's to prepare your hunger for dinner if you get it after dinner. It's something different by definition. And when they look at the Quran, when they look at the Sunnah of the Prophet, of his sayings, they feel very deeply, and I think this is an accurate critique, that Muhammad was either intentionally perverting Christian teachings 
or he was ignorant of them. He was misconstruing them. And I think that latter critique is obviously right. I mean, if you look at what the Quran seems to say about things like the Trinity, it's very clear that the author has no idea what the doctrine of the Trinity actually says. Same thing with the Incarnation. Very clear that the author of the Quran has no, um, no adequate understanding, not even remotely adequate understanding of what Christians believe when they say, you know, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So how can you then call Islam the preparation for the gospel? It came afterwards. By definition, it cannot be a preparation. It must be a corruption, uh, whether intentional or unintentional. That's the beginning of the modern missionary movement in 1910 in Edinburgh. And then everything changed with the First World War. And with that, I will leave this at its end. Thank you.